friends we all uh, know and i've been announcing it all these days during this amrita shergill national art week that uh, navina sundram is the niece of the iconic painter artist amrita shergill she is her sister indira's daughter we are honored privileged that she is amongst us we really welcome you we have a battery of talented people from the country here is sadanand menon he is going to engage with anju dodia tomorrow then here is atul dodia the iconic artist then here is anju dodia she is going to present her thing tomorrow then of course we have mithu sen you had seen her presentation yesterday and dayanita who is going to present her works to you after navina she is still engaged in photographing corbusier buildings outside she said uh, she'll come a little while later and then we have tasneem mehta she is also on the way she'll be joining us uh, in a few moments we are very proud very privileged very honored that people from all over the country who have made difference in the field of art and culture and thinking on art are here amongst us to share their thoughts and also enrich this you know modern city which is uh, painstakingly designed maintained and uh, you know uh, kind of uh, given impetus by our leaders our bureaucrats we are really proud of you and proud of the audience as well uh, i will run you through a few uh, um pictures paintings and comment on that uh, by quoting largely from her very expressive and beautiful letters erotic painting and sculpture could not possibly have been inspired by religious fervor as a matter of fact i think all art not excluding religious art has come into being because of sensuality a sensuality so great that it overflows the boundaries of the mere physical how can one feel the beauty of a form the intensity or the subtlety of a color the quality of a line unless one is a sensualist of the eyes Yes, I admit. Can we shift? Come move. These are a couple that she does in in uh, Paris. Can we shift? Okay. Yes, I admit few women can paint, and I think that is because they are as a general rule not passionate souls but sentimentalists. However, there are one or two exceptions. Suzanne Valadon for instance and a girl Marie Louise I knew If ever you come to Simla I will show you several of her pictures their strange little paintings worthy of El Greco's Marie Louise by a strange coincidence also dies about the same time as Amrita in 1941 they are the same age Suzanne Valadon between 1865 and 1938 Here are two examples of her work a nude and Catherine in wash tub was the one successful woman post impressionist painter of the period although Amrita's own work has little in common pictorially with the robustness verging on coarseness of Valadon's nudes Amrita herself hated all these references to gender when she was once awarded a prize for the best work by a lady artist in India she wrote I do dislike this type of distinction it rather smacks of concession due to the feebler sex a sister indira was a subject of this audacious composition this was amrita's most suggestive nude in sleep conventions of the academic nude have been raised fleetingly by a reminiscence of paul gauguin whose work she had admired during a visit to the national gallery in london a few months before painting this in 1933 Oh I've just seen a picture of Gauguin. I wanted to kneel in front of it. It was so beautiful. You would have loved it. She writes to her friend Denise Proto. European artists have been painting nudes for a long time. That women artists started to unclad the female body and to exhibit it in all its naked beauty was of a much later date. One must remember that the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris only started to admit women artists as late as 1897 during amrita's tour of south india in 1937 she writes to her sister 
I may have sold your nude to Nawab Salah Jung. After the Nizam, the richest man in Hyderabad, if I were a psychophant. He came to the exhibition and asked for those two pictures of, to be sent to his palace. He's supposed to be a connoisseur and is a collector. He has millions of rupees worth of junk at the same time as beautiful jade and good Mughal and Rajput paintings in his palace. But he invited us to see his collection and when I saw the Lord Leighton's, the Watts, the Bougereaux's amassed there and everybody in the party spouted admiration and praise, I felt so sick that when he asked me what I thought of them, I asked him in return how on earth anybody with any taste could buy Leighton's, Bougereaux's and Watts with Nerva Cezanne's, Van Gogh's and Gauguin's in the market. Sometime later, therefore, he decided that he had no use for these cubist pictures, namely, your nude. I was, of course, furious, as he had kept us on tenterhooks for several days and even delayed our departure by keeping the pictures at his place, and was therefore glad that I hadn't prostituted myself morally, even if it had cost one a few thousand rupees. Funny that I, who can accept a present without the least pang of conscience, should not be able to say that a bad picture is good, even if it is in my interest to do so. Karl Kandalawala once remarked, her sales would have been better had she been a little less tactless. Miss Shergill was not in the least charming when it came to a discussion on art, and she had no business sense at all. Denise Proutot, in an article, wrote in 1933 about this painting. The memory of one of her most recent pictures still haunts me. A woman seated in a pose as unesthetic as possible, with disheveled hair and ravaged breast, and in her eye all the misery of besotted humanity. From where has this young girl learned to see life with such pitiless eyes and this absence of illusions? Amita had just turned 20 when she painted this professional model, which she proudly describes as her first successful essay at art. Ambita represents herself half-nude in this self-portrait as Tahitian in a three-quarter profile view, an intimation, as it were, of shedding one identity and adopting another at precisely the moment when her Parisian sojourn was nearing its end. The year 1934 in which she painted this was also when she decided to return to India. It was here that she would arrive at not only a more nuanced application of Gauguin and other European painters, but also a more profound understanding of the ambitions of her own art. Towards the end of 1933, she writes, I began to be haunted by an intense longing to return to India, feeling in some strange, inexplicable way that there lay my destiny as a painter. My professor had often said that judging by the richness of my coloring, I was not really in my element in the great studios of the West that my artistic personality would find its true atmosphere in the color and light of the East. Amrita's creative period spanned exactly seven years. Three Girls, her first painting done in 1935 in India, reveals a subtle reorientation of the pictorial language in terms of what she had retained from the scrutiny of Gauguin's Tahitian works. Incidentally, these three sisters are Amrita's relatives, they sat for this painting. Almost till the time that I felt uh, the urge to go to India, I had been painting in the purely Western, in fact, almost academic style, placing the stress principally on the execution, which was considered to be extremely brilliant. But as soon as I put my foot on Indian soil, not only in subject and spirit, but also in technical expression, my painting underwent a great change, becoming more fundamentally Indian. It was a vision of a winter in India, desolate yet strangely beautiful, of endless tracts of luminous yellow-gray land, of dark-bodied, sad-faced, incredibly thin men and women who move silently, looking almost like silhouettes, and over which an indefinable melancholy reigns. It was different from the India, voluptuous, colorful, sunny, and superficial. The India, so false to the tempting travel posters that I had expected to see. I realized my real artistic mission then 
to interpret the life of Indians, and particularly the poor Indian pictorially, to paint those silent images of infinite submission and patience, to depict their angular brown bodies, strangely beautiful in their ugliness, to reproduce on canvas the impression their sad eyes created on me, to interpret them with a new technique, my own technique. I wish to be an interpreter of the atrocious psychological misery that abounds in our country and which has made a profound impression on me. Art, it is my conviction, must be connected with the soil if it is to be vital. She later refers to this period and this particular painting, Man in White, done in 1935 as her romantic phase, great soulful eyes in a melancholy face. Of hill men and hill women, one of her more fully achieved works, the most notable features are the simplification and stylization of forms that are basic to the modernist credo of picture making, but of which Amrita only took heed after her return to India. Despite her reliance on the posed scene, on painting from the model, her interests appear to have been in creating a figural type that would be both emblematic and iconic. Pictorially, this means a broad handling that leans towards mass and color for establishing the overall design, as in the expanse of the draperies conspicuous in both pictures. The verticality and somewhat stylized elongation of the figures confers upon them a rather statuesque presence. Amrita had a brief, passionate affair with Malcolm Muggeridge, an English journalist who was stationed for a short while in Simla in 1935. Talking about love and sensuality in another context, she writes to Carl, you are wrong. I have wasn't unhappy because I had fallen in love. I am always in love. But fortunately for me and unfortunately for the party concerned, I fall out of love or rather fall in love with someone else before any damage can be done. You know the type of alcoholic who stops drinking at the merry stage? Consequently, my emotional equilibrium is seldom upset. I feel, in fact, that one has to be in this state, a state of absolute calm, with no preoccupations of any sort, not even interests outside it, a complete though receptive void to enjoy any form of art, and particularly to create it. That is why I don't believe in the theory of the struggling artist who creates his masterpieces under the inspiring influence of hunger, or a muse in the shape of the lady of his heart. When Amrita paints his portrait of her father and my grandfather, Umrao Singh Shergil is 65, and his eyesight is failing him, a tragedy for this man of letters. He was a nationalist, whereas the rest of his family were British loyalists, an independent if reclusive scholar. He loved carpentry, was passionate about photography. We can see a lot of his work in the museum next door, in the gallery next door. He was a stargazer, an introvert, a dandy, an abiding pessimist, if not a melancholic, an eccentric, and somewhat Tolstoyan figure. There was a very strong bonding between father and daughter, even though Umrao Singh Shergil referred to Amrita's paintings as your horrors, albeit teasingly. About the incomprehension and harsh criticism of the other art critics, Barring Karl Kandalavala, she wrote, It is curious, not to say somewhat ironical, that these very Indian artists who spend their lives concealing the tragic face of India behind rose bars and who can't even justify their escapism by original or powerful pictorial interpretations should decry my work because it is not what, according to them, true interpretations of India should be. To those who say that I look at India with the eyes of a foreigner, I am amazed that at least they concede that I am a sympathetic foreigner. I answer, granting that it is not from within, granting that I am just Kipling turned sympathetic, granting that my work smells of the West, in the face of the blindness, a worse still voluntary blindness of most Indian artists, isn't it something that I should see? On the 15th of January, 1937, she writes, At Cape Comorin, where I have been for 10 days working, I have painted a largish composition, a woman with two children on an apple-green background. 
The figures are painted in dark red and raw sienna and are dressed in white. I am fairly satisfied with it. I feel I have assimilated a janta to some extent. What is so endearing about the impressions recorded in Amrita's letters is what they reveal of her desire to be seduced, enthralled, transported by all that she was discovering. And not only art, as the vivid descriptions of the South Indian landscape attest. In a letter to her sister from Trivandrum, she writes, I wish you were here. This is a wonderful place. Some nine miles from there, from here, there is a spot on the seashore where I should like to live. Just the sea, coconut forests, the naked fishermen, and silence. There is a little bungalow there, quite primitive, for travelers to stay, very cheap, where I wish I could spend months and months each year and paint and paint. This painting is incidentally here in the museum. The people, men, women, and children, are extraordinarily beautiful. The women wear a bodice and a dhoti, leaving the middle portion of their body naked. Both the men and women wear white exclusively. And I tell you, the general impression is fascinating. Imagine a background of rich emerald green vegetation, coconut palm, banana, all the large leaf decorative trees one sees in the paintings of Ajanta. The earth is in most places red ochre in color, little mud huts, sometimes red, sometimes yellow, according to the color of the earth, with triangular thatched roofs, slightly Chinese in style, snuggle at the foot of enormous coconut trees and are a fit setting for the people. The Chinese were in contact with the Travancoreans many centuries ago. Their influence is manifest in the ancient frescoes of Travancore temples. I don't know how I will ever resign myself to living and painting in Simla, or for that matter, anywhere in North India, after seeing the South. I saw Kathakali dancing at Trivandrum. It was a revelation, grotesque and subtle at the same time, an unusual combination, magnificent. Amrita is enamored and greatly impressed by the frescoes in the Matan Cherry Palace in Cochin, done between 17th and 19th century. They range from large compositions with almost life-size figures to entire walls covered with small figures and interwoven in the most intricate design so that sometimes one feels one is looking at a tapestry, so highly decorative is it, instead of a painting. They are done in tempera on plaster walls. It is only when one starts copying them. I've been at it for the last three days. Unfortunately, I have only paper and a few elementary watercolors at my disposal that one realizes what an astounding technique these people had and what an amazing knowledge of form and power of observation they possessed. Curiously enough, unlike the slender forms of Ajanta, the figures are extremely massive and heavy here. The drawing, perhaps the most powerful I have ever seen, even more powerful than Ajanta, although Ajanta is superior from the painting point of view, particularly in the treatment of drapery and jewelry, where not a single line is left to chance and everything is drawn with the utmost precision and virility. In spirit, it is as different from Ajanta as the Flemish masters are from Byzantine art. Bright's toilet can also be seen as a study in the body language of native types. The juxtaposition of the fair complexioned bride with her dark skinned attendants, the turn of her head, the delicately arched eyebrows, all point to comparable features in, Ajanta, in the Ajanta frescoes. Two sketches that she does in Ajanta. So, South Indian villagers going to market mark the end of a period in which the experiences in form and color derived from Ajanta and Allura dominated Amrita's work. Perhaps she realized that it was the furthest she could go in the assimilation of Ajanta. While in Bombay, Amrita's eyes had been open to various schools of miniature painting and so she turned to another facet of the Indian pictorial tradition. The new orientation was signaled by a change of scale and choice of subjects. The figures were no longer abstracted from their everyday surroundings. Two paintings of 1937, and we are now spanning a period from her beginning. That was in 1935. This is exactly two years, and I, I'm trying to point out the difference in the development in her style. 
Two paintings in 1937, Siesta and Storyteller, evinced the rather more intimate tenor that would come to dominate her work in the following years. The Bahari miniatures to which these works are beholden suggested a condensed and at the same time color-suffused pictorial composition. I have painted a lot of smallish, change please, compositions in the similar uh, spirit since. I have a need of expressing myself in this manner. I've been curiously happy the last few months. I don't know why. These little compositions are the expression of my happiness, and that is why perhaps I'm particularly fond of them and will always have a tender spot in my heart for them even when my calm vanishes and the little compositions along with it. Another quiet composition, a group of women in a field in which I want to bring out the contrast between the hot reds and greens one finds in the early Rajput miniatures that I love so. I have tried, though it is very, very difficult, to give all the figures in these pictures the flat relief. I am avoiding painting in volume of cardboard figurines pasted onto the canvas. A hill scene. Green hillsides, green upon green, rhododendron trees with stiff scarlet flowers, and a row of figures advancing towards the spectator. Little women in brilliant colors like parrots. In fact, there is something bird-like about them. Comical little profiles and small, thin legs. Is how Amrita describes this picture to Karl Kandalavala in a letter dated 1938. The figures tended to be rather like staffage, and this was a far cry indeed from the monumental effect of the hill men and hill women of three years earlier. I'm afraid our Lahore art critics have failed to grasp the significance of my latest work. Emotional appeal is still given preference over pictorial merit. They imagine that there is greater merit in spontaneity than in control, which they confuse with that which is studied, merely because looking at it superficially, the former is more pleasing to the eye. If I really took art critics seriously, my progress would have ceased long ago. Another period of transition is approaching, one of greater reflection, of more conscious painting, more observation, and more stylization in the sense of nature. That seems a contradiction, but I hope to prove very soon that it isn't, and preceding it, a period of stagnation. Resting is the only picture she paints that year on her return from Hungary in July 1939. Dear Karl, she writes, on the 1st July 1940, the period of the man in white in Mother India, great soulful eyes and a melancholy face, romantic, you know, I've grown out of that sort of thing. The Mughals have taught me a lot. Looked at rightly, the Mughal portraitists can teach one everything almost that matters. Subtle yet intense, keenness of form, acute and detached, somewhat ironical observation, all the things I needed most at the time I got acquainted with them. I have done some smallish things in which this is very apparent, though of course they still lean mainly on color. They're very lovely as color. I am progressing in that direction too, though I do not attach so much importance to it, for color is my domain, and I am on terms of easy domination with it. My sense of form, on the other hand, is only developing now, and still has a strong tendency to evade me. It very often happens that I grasp it only for a short period, and only sections of my pictures are good as a consequence. But still, I consider it something that I master, even if as yet only in portions. Feeling impotent, dissatisfied, irritable, not even able to weep. There seem to be forces at work, elemental forces disrupting, throwing things out of equilibrium. The chaos and darkness of the lives of individuals, the wars, the earthquakes, floods, all seem to be indefinably interconnected. We are not alone. I see it everywhere. She writes to her friend, Helen Chamanlal, in April 1941. I haven't touched a brush or gone near a canvas for over four months. I don't know why. I'm gripped by a sort of fear whenever I think of working again, a sort of paralysis of the spirit. I suppose it could be explained by a very simple and obvious reason if I sat down to analyze it, but I just cannot bring myself to. I suppose one can get out of the habit of painting. The spell is suddenly broken now and I'm working again, working with passion. I'm beginning to get interested in animals. 
elephants, of course, first and foremost. Elephants, next one. Camels and buffaloes. I've just completed a little picture. Four little girls weaving baskets. The background an acid lemon yellow. The children a medley of hot color. It's painted with all the desire, the greed almost that comes after a long abstinence. She writes in September 1941. Three months later, she dies. This is the last unfinished painting. And that is the span of a short creative life of exactly eight years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naminaji. It is the way you have described everything through your, you know, lecture. I shouldn't call it a lecture, but uh, I have to use a word for that. And uh, a large body of work which we have been talking about and shown in such a quick succession without really losing the meaning and you know, bringing things in its proper perspective. Thank you very much indeed. Sir.